Good afternoon, everyone. This is going to be, I think, an exciting video. For, but to start, just to start, before the video began, I reassured our guest here that COVID-wise, I'm safe because I had it a few months ago and I am within a 90-day window of herd immunity. So, <laughs> that's right. So, I cannot guarantee that I will not ask you embarrassing questions about your area of expertise, but let's get right into it. My name is Andy Norton. I am with Samson Properties, but our guest today is talking about vacation rentals. Patricia Moore from McLean is dare I say, the vacation rental queen? Pretty okay. much. Okay, <laughs> pretty much. So in the course of this interview, you're gonna to have to justify that title. But for starters, when we first met, you had not been doing vacation rentals. No, we've known each other a long time. That's right. Yeah. So at some point you did your first vacation rental and you probably discovered it was just easy money, like putting your putting your mouth under a faucet full of dollars. That is a fantasy. See. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, tell us how you got started doing vacation rentals, and if it's long enough ago, sort of like how vacation rentals have evolved. Okay. So, I actually started in vacation rentals back in 2008. Oh, my. It's been a long time. And... Um, I fell into it. You know, sometimes you fall into it, but that's pretty common with this indus industry. Mm -hmm. A lot of people find out about it, want to try it, and they kind of fall into it. But I fell into it a long time ago in comparison to most people. And uh, I decided I wanted to try it. I got a book. I read the book from, com from cover to cover in two okay. days. And I was like, I can do this. <laughs> so I put an ad on Craigslist. And within days, I had my first guest. Days? Literally within days, I had my first guest that was coming in a couple of weeks. Okay. They were coming into our peak season, which in Washington, D.C. is the Cherry Blossom Festival. And it was a group, um, a Christian school with a group of girls and boys that were being, you know, taken care of by loving adults. So you did not need to be the chaperone. No, they, no. they had the chaperones You're the landlord, out. not the chaperone. And... <laughs> I was asked, you know, do you take credit cards? And of course I said yes, which I didn't at the time. But within two days, I did. <laughs> but it, it's far more work than you think it's going to be. It's far more work than you think it's going to be. You have to have a, a very expert interest in, being, in helping other people. You really have to want to help other people. And, you know, you've got to have a very pristine house. You've got to have decent furnishings and you have to take care of people when they're here because they're new to the area and they're not sure exactly what to do or where to go. So as you get better and better at it, you learn how to make sure people are encouraged to go to the places that you love the most. Mm -hmm. In Washington, D.C., that's the monuments and the Air and Space Museum and going to the Capitol and going to the White House, everything along our mall. And the nice thing about D.C. is almost everything is free which is rare in the country. So we're one of the top 10 destination spots in our country. So it's a very popular place to come. And I'm only 10 minutes from Arlington Cemetery, so a lot of people come for family burials as well. It's really a wonderful place to visit. Did you make money on the first one? I did. Okay. Instantly. <laughs> Instantly. But um, it, you don't make money hand over fist. That is a fallacy. It, you have to really look at the net. You know, what you gross is not at all the net. You know, you still have to pay mortgage payments and handymen and maids and okay. landscapers. There, there's expenses. From when you rent your place out, do you still call yourself a landlord? So are you a landlord? Or no. is there another term that's applied? The biggest term that is supplied now is host. You're a, a host. host. Okay. You're a host. And has the business of being a host changed between 2008 and, and today? I mean, if somebody comes into town now for the cherry blossoms and they want to rent a place from you with you being the host, mm -hmm. um, is that relationship with the incoming guest uh, changed over time between 2008 and today? You know, it really depends on what your best guests are. In my particular case, 
you know, my best guests really are families. Mm -hmm. The majority of them are families or students. And they're coming in for a very short time to vacation to the, you know, the nation's capital to see whatever they're gonna see. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't changed. That has not changed. I think there are a lot more people now that are doing workforce rentals. There's, that, there's a big area for that, which are longer rentals. They call those midterm rentals. And the other thing that's really changed is when I joined in 2008, it was, it was brand new. It wasn't really brand new. Vacation rentals go back thousands of years, but it was really brand new on the internet. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And now there's 5 million rooms worldwide. There are more rooms available than there are hotels. It has really changed. And you can get everything from sleeping on a couch still, to renting a room in somebody's house, to a private residence, to a castle. I mean, it is a very wide range of what you can do. Do you ever get people who, let's say, are having a new home built and for whatever reason the delivery is running late and they're panicked and they need to have, have a place for the family? Is that common? It is common, um, especially in the Washington DC area. It's hard to find a place to stay. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a military kid myself, we traveled around and we moved every two years. And in between every place that we stayed, we would stay in hotels. Mm -hmm. So for purchasing a property, for repairing a property, for going from transitioning from one career to another and moving to a new geographic place, I've had a number of people that have stayed, very high level executives from different companies. So they stay for long periods of time and it's wonderful. Wonderful for me mm -hmm. and wonderful for them. They don't have to go into a building where there's a thousand other people with a lot of different groups, with a lot of different doors. They come to one house, they get out of their car, they walk in the door, it's their property. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've wondered about is how does somebody get started? Let's say someone's watching the video and they say, this is something I want to do. Do they contact a realtor and say, I want to buy a property for a short-term vacation rental? What would be the conversation? How do they get started? Well, realistically, you want to do some research. You know, I jumped in. I'm a cliff jumper, so I jumped in. Oh. I jumped in and I loved yes. it. Yeah. Most people do. That's kind of what most people do. They try it where they are. Mm -hmm. And then as they get more in depth in the industry, they find out more and more about what's important. But the industry has gotten a lot more crowded. So you really need to look around at what other people are building billing for a per night basis. Mm -hmm. Because you want to make sure that your nightly rate which will equate to a monthly rate or your season, right. because it is a seasonal business in most areas, that that will really cover your expenses of the property. So even if you're gonna buy, you need to make sure that it's gonna cover the mortgage plus, because you have to cover the utilities, mm -hmm. which are gonna be higher. You have to cover handyman services, which are gonna be higher because people have a difficult time finding the light switch in a new place. They don't know exactly where they are yeah. and they're rougher on a building. So, you know, you keep a handyman on tap to be able to help out with anything that comes up at any time. Um, and you have to keep in mind that professional cleaning services are critical. You need to have somebody come in and clean it and clean it clinically correctly so that it's good for the next person, especially when we had COVID. One of the things I've wondered about, because as you know, I have rentals, but I just put a tenant in it for a year and forget about it. Would, if I make my peace with the notion, I'm going to have higher handyman expenses and higher cleaning expenses, mm -hmm. am I in a sense leaving money on the table or throwing money away by having an annual tenant rather than a vacation rental? It really depends on the person. You know, vacation rentals aren't for everybody. They take a lot of time. It takes a lot of care. There's a lot of interaction with guests. People need help to figure out where the restaurants are, how to use the metro service, how to get around town. And you want to help people when you do that. But it is a far more interactive relationship than a long-term rental. In a long-term rental, you stick somebody in, you do a background and a credit check, um, you sign a lease with them, you might set up some kind of automatic draft, and that's it, you're done, pretty much. As mm -hmm. long as you get good tenants in, there's pretty much nothing else. The turnover can be 
as as small as nightly, which I don't do, but um, you know, even if it's every three or four days, mm -hmm. that's a heck of a lot of people to interact with. One of the things I've wondered about, so the organization that you're active in is called Vacation Rentals by Owner, is that correct? It's Global Vacation Rental Association. Glo okay, Global Vacation Rental Association. Right. Um, I gather that is different from, I mean, if you're talking about like a facial tissue, people say Kleenex, okay? Right. And I think that in your space, people often say Airbnb. Exactly. What would be a difference between Airbnb and let's say what you're doing? Is it just an organizational umbrella or is there a practical difference that a guest would notice from the host? So my business as far as doing rentals is not Global Vacation Rental Association. Mm -hmm. Global Vacation Rental Association is a nonprofit that is really set up to educate people and provide some level of training for advocacy to get especially fair regulations. Because it's a new industry, people are not still not really sure what to do. Um, but from a standpoint of people really recognizing Airbnb, VRBO, trip, you know, Flipkey, TripAdvisor, there are hundreds of places where you can advertise a vacation rental. The thing that is really different is when you go on Airbnb, you post pictures, you answer questions about your property, and then you have a space that is like a billboard on the internet. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a billboard on the internet. Now they also act as a conduit so you can see somebody's calendar, you can reserve space, and you can pay for space, and then the host in turn gets paid as well. But they're very different businesses. One of them is really about education and support, and the other one is about where you actually advertise and put your business and you get inquiries. Like just before I walked in here, I got an inquiry for six months for my property. Okay. So. One of the things we spoke about before this interview started had to do with um, building building wealth for for women and that, especially yes and a lot of the people in the audience may not know but the fastest growing poverty group in America right now uh, are widows typically women over 65 and for whatever reason when their spouses pass they do not have the means to take them through to the rest of their lives. Exactly. But you feel that uh, vacation rentals properly handled can bring in income to supplement this. So tell us a bit more about that. So, you know, I know a lot of single ladies that do vacation rentals. And in fact, percentage wise, more than 50% of hosts are women. And they come from a variety of different backgrounds. Some of them are retired, some of them are older, some of them are teachers, um, but it is people that are looking to sup supplement their in income. And that is a big thing is to get a mm -hmm. secondary source of income for a lot of people. Social Security doesn't do everything. So sure. to start, you know, basically a lot of people, they'll rent a room or rooms in their property. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it actually gives them a little bit more than having a monthly renter in there and then they can have somebody come and go and they're not there permanently mm -hmm. and it's a great source of income for that person. I also think as people get older, which I think is actually really important, you're not so isolated, which is really important for older people when That's they're true. it's not good to be alone. Yeah. You know, so you know, I know people that have built relationships with their guests where they go to visit, visit them in other parts of the country. They have dinner with them regularly. They go to events together. So there are friendships that are made out of these relationships as well. Mm -hmm. um, host groups getting together and knowing each other as well as hosts getting to know their guests that way. Yeah. It makes a big difference in life. And again, it's better if you're going to be a host, if you are an extrovert rather than an introvert? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> Okay. Being a host really requires that you are very comfortable talking to a lot of people and you're not mm -hmm. afraid to. Um, you know, somebody that just wants to be alone and doesn't really want to talk to people and really wants to be in their own space, that's not a good fit. Um, it's just not really a good fit for the industry um, or that person, you know, mm -hmm. which is the most important thing. But from a standpoint of if you're an extrovert and you like to meet new people and you like to go places and you like to have dinners with friends, things like that, 
it can be great. It really can be great. So if I'm going to start from scratch, either as a realtor or working with somebody who comes to me and says, Andy, I want to buy a vacation rental. So I take it, number one, it's better that there's no homeowners association because I'm guessing typically homeowners associations don't want vacation rentals. Is that true? I'd say nine times out of ten, yes. Okay. HOAs are a no-no. Okay. In general. In general. In general. So I would be looking for, and probably condominium associations, same deal. As, uh, it, dep <laughs> it depends on the condominium really? association. So, it really yeah. does, because like Florida is the biggest vacation rental place in the world. They mm -hmm. have 275,000 rentals in the state of Florida. Wow. It's a lot. So there are many vacation rentals that are in condos right on the beach, and people want those. Mm -hmm. So it really, it kind of depends on where it is. It does okay. depend on where it is. Within a condo, for example, um, is there, if they allow it, they allow it for like a day or a week, or are they going to say a six-month minimum, or does that kind of thing just vary? It all really depends on the specific HOA, so you really need to read those documents that you signed or before you purchase a property mm -hmm. to really dig into the detail of it, of exactly what it says about what you're allowed to do. You may be able to rent. You know, on a monthly basis, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a biannual basis, and you may not be able to. HOAs can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you? You're describing a lot the individual relationship that the host has with a guest. Right. Um, is it possible to handle this from a distance? Absolutely. Okay, so that you could have a place in Hawaii and a place in Miami, but still live here in the Washington, D.C. area. You absolutely can. Okay. Absolutely. Do you need a professional manager, necessarily, because of the distance? I go back and forth on this. Right. Um, okay. Honestly, I know a lot of professional managers that are fantastic at what they do. And what the professional managers bring to the table is sometimes decades of experience, literally decades. They also bring a base of clients that want to go to that particular area over and over again. That's not true of everybody that's searching mm -hmm. the internet. Um, and then they also have all these people that work together with them. So if one of their maids doesn't show up for one location, they may be able to pull one from another location. So they're very good at tucking and pointing where things go on. They also do things like, and there are things that general hosts can do, but property managers generally use a lot of tools kind of similar to hotels where they can identify exactly how the pricing is. So say the president's getting inaugurated. I won't say on which side. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's but all right. If the president's getting inaugurated, I know how you vote. Don't oh, worry. Yeah, yeah. Well, we won't talk about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. right. but that is a time where people really want to be in a vacation rental, and you want somebody that can help you with it appropriately. Correct. That's right. Yeah, under high demand. So. But individually, if you're a good person and you know the area that you're in and you're responsive, you can do it as well. You just don't come in with decades of experience. Is there some point where it's just too many? Like, obviously, you can handle one or two or three. But as you, if you have professional management, can you actually build up a significant network of vacation rental homes? Yes. You okay. really can. Okay. So you we're really not talking can. about All cutting it off world. three or four? No. Okay. No. You In can grow as big as you want to. So all over the world, is there, do people who buy these things for, let's say, in Mexico or in the Caribbean, are they buying all cash? Are they getting financing from a local bank? Or, I mean, do they tend to be all cash buyers at a certain point? It, no, it depends on what I'm seeing. Um, it's really being looked at. Uh, far more in detail, cap rates are being discussed and so on. That's for sure. Financing is being looked at from a standpoint of what's best. Mm -hmm. You know, when the interest rates were down at 2% 2 per, 2 or 3%, you know, was your money better off on a note, on a 30-year loan versus in comparison to paying cash? I mean, there's a lot of variables that go with that. So you can finance these. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you can finance them. Um, or you can pay for them all cash. It's going in both directions, but I do think that with the real estate market in general, 
the people that win the bids, they have cash. Okay. So yeah. one of the things I've wondered about, and I think I know the answer, but you tell me, that if somebody is buying a vacation rental, they're not buying it for a flip a couple of years down the road. They're buying it for a, as a forever hold. Is that true? In general, yeah. Okay. In general, yeah. And that sort of feeds into another topic that we had discussed back and forth prior to the show, and that is generational wealth building. Mm -hmm. So somebody is buying a home that they're going to be a host in as vacation rental, mm -hmm. and it's going to be like a forever hold. It's not like five years and I'm going to try to flip it. Um, at some point, um, the host is going to leave it to family as part of building uh, generational wealth? I do think that that's definitely a big factor and it's something I think about personally a lot. I have one son, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. Andy, and you know, so I think about what I'm leaving for him, but I also think about what happened with me. I was left money with both of my grandparents and wouldn't be where I am if I hadn't had that help. Mm -hmm. So I do think that you actually, by getting into a property and you know, putting it on as a vacation rental, your guests are actually paying the mortgage payment and they're paying right. down the equity for you and what you actually owe. And you're, they're paying down the expense and your equity is actually building on that property. So I think in the long run, you can pass it forward. Not everybody keeps properties the way I do. I'm kind of a forever home person, but mm. I do think that there's a very good venue for that. I do think you'll see some people that are starting with the market being the way that it is because it is getting saturated in some areas that you may see people letting them go. But it's a good, if it's a good business and you run it well, why would you do that? Why would you give up your business? So one reason, transition to another topic that is near and dear to your heart, why would you give it up, if, even if it is a good business? And that has to do with regulation, mm -hmm. okay, um, local and otherwise. So why don't, you, why don't you talk a little bit about what happens when the neighbors organize and say, we don't want vacation rentals in our neighborhood. Is that typically how the opposition starts? Well, I'm, I'm going to transition back on a timeline. <laughs> Honestly, the way that this started was with the hotel lobby. Honestly, that's how it started. It's not the neighbors, it's the hotels. Well, it started with the hotel lobby, but I think as people found out about it, in some cases, the neighbors were afraid of what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I will have to say, after, in my particular case, renting to thousands and thousands of people, I never had a neighbor, neighbor complaint ever with multiple properties, mm -hmm. not once. And that's common. That's really common. However, what's happening is that the bills are being written. Sometimes those negotiations are starting to be talked at at the state level. Mm -hmm. And ho the hotel lobby's been around for more than 100 years. So yeah. they have relationships with the, you know, the people that actually regulate and make decisions and write bills and write regulations. So they go down and they write, this is what the bill is gonna look like. And it's very disadvantageous to owners of properties. So by over-regulating, you're really taking away somebody's property rights to be able to rent the property and make an income on it, which is actually a constitutional right. And there are lawsuits all over the country into the tunes of millions and millions of dollars and those regulations are getting turned back. Okay, so you're saying that with all the people that you've dealt with in your career as a host, yeah. that you have not had one single neighbor complaint about never. Any, any of your guests? Not never. One, not one? Not a single one. And if you've never had complaints, I'm guessing, have you ever had like a really bad guest experience? Of course I have. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so you deal with you deal with a bad guest experience one on one, but it doesn't reach the neighbor. Yeah, and you know, honestly, with a guest experience, you know, with an unhappy guest experience, a lot of times that's really kind of a customer service issue. Mm -hmm. You know, it really depends on the host and the situation of what's going on. But you know, it might be that um, somebody is just not happy with the number of towels I provide. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a big house. It sleeps a lot of people, and I don't have the ability to turn over a house in a, a short period of time and wash all the towels. I personally don't. Now, you can hire in a linen service, but that's my choice. Right. But it's written into my rental agreement 
one towel and washcloth per guest. If you want more, bring them. There's washers and dryers in the house. They can wash them too, but <laughs> yes. it's not like a hotel. I think that, let's say someone is an extrovert and they do want to do this. Um, are there people who really shouldn't? I mean, because I, I started the saying, there is a perception in the broader community that this is easy money. And obviously you're saying it's not easy money. No. Yes. So for generational wealth, should somebody do it? Yes. For women who want to supplement their income, you're saying definitely yes. Yeah. What kind of a person really should find some other thing to invest in? What, what would be a profile of somebody who should not be doing this? A total introvert, somebody that is can't deal with people walking through, through their house, somebody that cannot understand that when a dish is broken that they're going to have to replace it because these things happen. Yeah. Um, it, it's just somebody who doesn't have kind of an open sense that's very welcoming to people that are coming in to stay with you. Gotcha. Somebody who really wants to be alone. Okay. Yeah, that, that's not a good... Invest in, a real, in the real estate market through REITs, you know, in the stock market. Well, yes. We won't get into the stock market. Not, not in these times. Exactly. Exactly. So um, the, this umbrella organization that you're a part of, mm -hmm. uh, how can somebody get in touch with you or with them? Your website address, for example? It's globalvra.org. <laughs> so it's victorralphassociation.org. Globalvra.org. Right. Patricia Moore, thank you very much for enlightening us with respect to vacation rentals. And thank you, Andy, for having me. Okay. Thanks, Thomas.